to develop some of the most streamlined packaging in the world. He produced mobile services for pregnant women in Africa and also pioneered lighting behavior for uh, millions of phones. He's now focusing his work on closure experiences. And that's what he's gonna talk about once he has a microphone. Please give it up for Joe McLeod. So, hi. It is working, yes, the microphone's working. So, I wanted to talk to you about closure experiences. Now, in the mid-90s, about 2004, I had a couple of experiences that made me think a lot about endings, product and service endings. One of those was a service called Wildfire that Orange brought out. It was a voice recognition type avatar service. It pr promised all sorts of things for the future. And you'd record messages with it, and, and it would say things like, you've had six messages today, and it would try and start a conversation with me. Obviously, voice, voice technology, and you're out and about on the road, and it compresses a lot of the sound, it actually wasn't very good. It used to obvious, often say to me, sorry, I don't understand that. Sorry, I don't understand that. I got to the point with Wildfire, where I hated it so much, I didn't just want to end the relationship, I wanted to actually kill it and have some sort of physical ending. I wanted to squeeze its avatar-type neck until I saw its cyborg eyes flicker into darkness. The other experience I had was when I was teaching. I set the cliché project of um, what to do with waste and um, other things that we create in the product landscape to a load of students. They went off excitedly about what they could do about changing the planet and the earth and saving ourselves from our own uh, mortality, I guess. So they all came back. All of them had created something new, some more stuff to put into the landscape. And it occurred to me with these two experiences that actually we have no vocabulary around endings. We only have the ability to start new things. And we can see that in the way that we mismanage and talk around subjects like climate change and bankers that missell and the privacy issues that we create in our digital landscape. So in the last, I guess, 15 years, since around 2004, I've been fiddling around with closure experiences. And in the last 18 months after leaving us too, I've uh, started to work on it full time. And so, Hopefully, I can share that with you now. So I'm going to take you through what a closure experience is and why the customer life cycle is biased. I'm going to show you how this situation has been created over many centuries and how it impacts us, the psychology around it. Good and bad closure experiences, which there are quite a few of both, and some techniques and models that I've developed along the way. So I define closure as a satisfactory conclusion to a product or service relationship. Each party feeling satisfied with that completed transaction, it being a fair and just conclusion without negative consequence. Now that echoes a lot around the damage we've done in our physical landscape, the misjustice in some of our service landscape, and the potential unraveling of some of our emotions in our digital landscape. But it's not something that's come about quickly. This is something which we can look at as, the, as we break down the customer life cycle. So if we look at the customer life cycle, we can break that into three broad categories. We have an onboarding experience, a usage experience, and an offboarding experience. Onboarding is populated by starting experiences. Starting experiences are things like advertising, marketing, packaging, T's and C's, things that encourage us to get on board with a product or service. We then go into a period of usage where we're in a stable relationship with that product or service. At that point, many of us start to get a bit tired, a bit bored. Providers start to get bored as well. They start to think, oh, maybe we could sell them something else. We get another starting experience going. And then as consumers, we start to go, oh, God, that looks good over there, a new version of what I've currently got. And we sort of, 
before we get to closure experiences and the proper off-boarding experience, we skip back through this lack of interest in finalizing the customer life cycle. We skip back to another starting experience. So from this, we can suggest that the customer life cycle is quite biased. There's a gap of interest between both ourselves and, and the companies. We're in it together. We're not going to point fingers at any particular company or big industry. And the consequences of this are in our product landscapes, our digital landscapes, and our service landscapes. And it's something which has actually been happening for centuries, and we're losing grips on it. So I'll just take you through the social context of it. Hundreds of years ago, we'd be toiling on the fields or in horrible sort of little houses, creating the cottage industry or working the land. Poverty was rife. Our experience was horrible, really. We'd have a lot of starvation. Death was all around us. People didn't even name children until they were two years old in some, in some cultures because of the high mortality rate. So a lot of the time, we were thinking about this other place, this other heaven. We wanted to get through this awful life and experience what was something else, something better. And we created these structures called religions, and they guided us through life with the payoff at the end of that life with heaven. They were, in fact, the sort of gatekeepers of closure experiences in the few hundred years ago. And eventually, we started to get a bit more comfort in our life. The Industrial Revolution brought around a certain level of um, betterness and a bit of quality for us, and we started to appreciate some sort of life on earth, which was comparable to heaven. Abundance started to manifest itself in, you know, over those few hundred years. And medicine, at the same time, started to push back on death and started to allow us to live a bit longer, lower child mortality and adult mortality as well. And with that, we started to get a bit repulsed about death. We started to think, oh, death's pretty ugly. Let's tuck that away behind the scenes in service sort of industries. So we created hospitals and old people's homes, hide it away from ourselves. And that allowed us to indulge in this sort of abundance of heaven on earth. And here we are today. So we can say from that that heaven used to be afterlife, but now pretty much heaven is life for many of us in the West. Death was an expected part of life, and now death is very much hidden from life. Death was controlled and managed by religion, but medicine now controls that. And our consumer relationships are mimicking this. Closures respected, familiar, and expected previously, but now closures distant, alien, and to be avoided for many. And we can see that when we dig into the customer life cycle a bit more and see the history around that. So if you think back to the 15th century, not that you were there, none of us were, but think back to the 15th century and seeing how our relationship with closure and waste was very tightly coupled with how we consumed things. So the sort of things that we consumed on the table in the kitchen, we'd eat stuff, and then the wastage of that would go and feed the animals. And the waste from the animals would then go on, put on the land to then grow more stuff. That rebirth was very close to us. We were active in it. We could see it. Even when we were creating things in these cottage industries in our own homes, we were, it used to be, on many occasions, it would be the same family creating a particular product of textiles or something. Someone would be sewing, someone would be um, creating other aspects of it. And then you'd sell it to a man at the door that would come around every day or every few days, and uh, you'd sell it locally as well. It was very tightly coupled. You had a very clear responsibility around wastage and closure. But the Industrial Revolution changed a lot of that. So as a consumer, we started buying more things. Things were more accessible to us. But equally, we were distanced because we were starting to move into factories. We were drilling holes in sheet metal. You had no control over the wastage of the life cycle inside the factory. That was down to the guy who owned the factory. Equally, you could have gone into start um, experiencing department stores where many traders would gather together and you'd be having a convenient access to consumption. 
but our perception of waste and uh, dirt was starting to change as well. Where when we started to recognize that coral existed, we had to change our perception to waste being a germ and invisible, and it distanced us from closure. At the same time, with consumption, we were, we were able to live our dreams a little bit more through our products. And with the sort of abundance we had, we didn't have to wait around for things to wear out or get broken. We could just chuck it away, buy a new one, and didn't even need the money. Credit started to become very popular. But equally, we're starting to impact many, many levels of things. So within the food chain, we can impact many different animals. And with things like space flight, it then recalibrated our vision of what the sort of environment we were living in was like. And then also made us think again about how waste and closure exist. Create the internet, massive new landscape to create and consume in. But also recognize that our consumption starts to impact the whole earth. One click shopping, it couldn't be more convenient. I mean, how quick is that? And then we've created stuff that's so complex and so few people understand it and we can't actually stop it. We've created things that are too big to fail. What a ridiculous thing. Yet we can every day, and I'm sure we're going to do it a load over the next few days. 1.8 billion photos shared in 2014. I know my photo sharing's gone up, so I'm sure that's over 2 billion now. But we can't stop any one of them. We built a system that is uh, based around the fact that it might get hit by a nuclear weapon. Is that the only off button we have for the photo you shared? It will actually be there even if there's a nuclear strike. So we can say from this that our relationship with closure and ending and waste has been just moved so far away from ourselves. It's not actionable anymore. We've removed any sort of level of discussion, vocabulary, or anything around that. And it's created a psychosis in us where you have two selves pretty much now. So if you think about how almost within an hour you can actively be in two of these type of people. You could do your recycling and be thoughtful about like this big industry or the poisoning of some lake in some place. You couldn't then just pop on the internet, buy something else, buy a flight, get a new car, because, oh, I think we need a new car. And there's many other psychological issues around closure experiences and death and this sort of ending of life cycles. I'll get into a couple of them here. So um, in 1973, Ernest Becker wrote a book called Denial of Death. I don't know if anyone's read it. He actually won the Booker Prize around that time. Um, he believed that almost every activity that we do in our life has something to do with leaving a legacy. We're so, we're so horrified. In fact, it's called terror management theory, where we're managing the terrier, terror of our death. So in that, we start to create all aspects of things that might outlive us. You could include having children in that. But we're actually consuming as a version of getting, uh, getting past dying. So we're all in denial of things ending. Kessler and Sheldon in 2000 done a bit of research, and then they said in that they got around 30 people together. They split them into two groups. The first group, they got to listen to jazz, and the second group, they got to think about their death and their own mortality. They then asked them questions about consumption and how they see themselves in the future and what sort of affluence they might have, what sort of jobs. What they found was that many of the people that were, or in fact all of the people which were thinking about death were far more aggressive in their perception of where they're going to be in five years' time, what sort of consumption ability they're going to have, what sort of houses they're going to have, what sort of cars they're going to have. The people who listen to jazz seem to be not as interested in that aspect of things. That might have something to do with jazz, but maybe if they listen to garage, that might be another thing. However, it, we are impacted in our, our relationship with consumption when we think about death. 
I'm sure many of you have heard of Daniel Kamen's work on peak end rule, often misinterpreted, I think, into endless peaks, not ends. So he'd done some work with observing people who are having colonoscopies. I think the short end of that goes there, goes up your bottom. It's not a very comfortable procedure, as you can imagine. But it is very, it's a very simple thing to observe. It lasts between 4 and 15 minutes, and it's not um, dangerous in any way, but it is quite uncomfortable for people. So he observed how people experienced it. Many people experienced a lot of discomfort in it, but he found that that didn't really change depending on the length of period. They didn't have many peaks. They tended to recognize one peak of uncomfortableness and the end. Yet many industries just think, oh, it's just hammer, peaks in. But actually, you don't remember many more peaks than one. So why do many peaks? There's stacks of companies. In fact, I think the whole of the business industry is in denial of the end. They can't consciously think about it. They haven't got a vocabulary for ending. They've got infinite vocabularies about growth, acquisition, more starting experiences. They've got very little vocabulary about endings. Now, Sky is a great example of this, and there's many more. To the consumers that wanted to leave Sky, they made them go through a one-hour sales uh, interview on the telephone. Now, of those people, I'm reckoning, there's people who just, well, oh, yeah, actually, I didn't want to leave Sky. I've got the wrong number here. Yeah, I'll sign up for more of that. There's probably another group which are like, oh, I've buckled under like the next 20 minutes of getting sales. There's probably another group of people who suffered through it all and actually got out the other side. And I think they've probably damaged their brand out of that. Imagine being hosting a party and then you punch someone on the way out and then put them in the cupboard. <laughs> I don't reckon you're going to have a, a great brand after that. But Sky and many other businesses think that's the only way to do things. So closure is a powerful memory moment. Why aren't we thinking about it? So after doing this sort of stuff for, well, nearly 15 years, which makes me think I should have probably got further in that time. However, I'm a little bit more on it now in the last 18 months. So a good closure experience, I believe, has these aspects and these characteristics. It should be visibly connected to the starting experience. I don't mean it just has to be visual, it has to be consciously connected, yeah? And this should be through emotional triggers that are actionable by the user in a timely manner. Now, let's look at some of those in a bit more detail. I'm sure many of you have gone out and got a printer ink cartridge and uh, proudly go home with your new printer ink cartridge turn your printer on, get the old one out, put the new one in, and it goes zigger, 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 and you stand there waiting for it to settle down so you can print out some tedious document. And then you turn to your empty printer ink cartridge and you go, what do I do with that? And then you think, oh, wait a minute, it's probably got something on the packaging. And then you look at the packaging and there's nothing. There's two bits of marketing material on the packaging, which in this context I really don't care about. There's another thing on the packaging, which is some symbols, which I sort of don't understand. And I'm also being told by about benzizothozol, benz which is also not very actionable. So I look into this, and I think, God, I really, what do I do with this? And I go online, and I find that actually Canon's had a very active printer recycling program for the last sort of 10, 15 years. Why isn't, it, why isn't there anything on this? As part of my life cycle experience, why isn't there anything on this bit of packaging? Equally, so then I have to then fill in a form and then sign up to this Canon program so that they can send me a small envelope like this. And then I can put it in there and send it back to them. However, this massive lump of packaging that I got has 500 milliliters of empty space in it. That thing folds down to about 60 milliliters. So why don't they put all of that together? There's another thing in digital. We're creating a really appalling cluttered landscape in the digital industry, in the digital landscape. 
Adjust, which is a market research firm in the US, recently done some work looking at the App Store. Now, of the 23 different categories in the App Store, when you search, you only search the top 300. So there's a lot of apps on the App Store that aren't getting searched, they found. They call them zombie apps, which I think is a very apt name. Apt, uh, apt, anyway. And uh, over 80% of them, yeah, are zombies. That's shocking, isn't it? So we can't really see those apps. So what are they doing there? What are we going to do about that? We, again, aren't really discussing it because it's invisible to us. Also, with pensions, in the UK, roughly, we have about 11 employers in our lifetime, according to the Department of Works and Pensions. I'm sure in many countries in the West, we're probably doing similar. We have uh, pension pots for each one of them. It's quite hard to merge pension pots. Age Concern done some research. They reckon one in four of those pension pots go missing just out of the longevity of that lifespan of trying to keep in touch with someone over, what, 40 years? I know I've lost a pension pot. The FD at our old company, he lost two. He's a financial professional. So we can't deliver these services over a long period of time because we're so, so excited about creating another one. Let's get another pension pot. Let's get another one. Another starting experience. Should we deliver it over 40 years? No, it's too complicated. Let's merge with another big company. On the upside, there is some great work going on. Epson's just brought out this, this enormous prototype. This is a paper pulping recycling machine, I guess you call it, for your office. If you have an office that fits two cars in it, I guess. It's a prototype at the moment, but it's a great intention because what that does is instead of us chucking paper recycling in a paper recycling bin, it getting picked up by a lorry, going off to a pulp pulping place, then going to a paper place, then coming back to us through some sort of uh, sales way, we can put it in one end and it comes out the other. Imagine how useful this is for lawyers who are concerned about secure shredding. They come down here and put some delicate files in here and... Uh, all of a sudden, they're pulped into something brand new. <laughs> it's great. Emotional triggers. And we use these all the time in starting experiences, always being tickled in our emotional crevices that we have another starting experience. You deserve it. I remember sitting next to my dad and his mates as they smoked away through the 70s and 80s looking at those packs, thinking how cool it was. Tiny little message on it said, yeah, maybe you shouldn't smoke, it's really bad for you. You know, we've all found out that it's really bad, but carry on anyway. Ten years later, we started to think, maybe if we shouted on it, we wrote in caps, maybe they'll be listening then. No, because it's barren, isn't it? It's emotionless. So they didn't know one listened then. Then we started putting horrible pictures that you find in medical journals on it. They have, people are starting to listen now. They are now we're starting to realize that we shouldn't start smoking. And we've got to the point now where we're only packaging this material in horrifying closure experience type stuff. So in the UK, they've just passed a law. This is going to come out in the UK soon. This actually is an example from Australia. It's great, we've gone from 98% starting experience to 100% closure experience because of our inability to have a discussion with consumers about endings. Has anyone read this book? Marie Kondo's uh, Book of Tidying, yes. Yeah. It's brilliant, I suggest you read it, it's brilliant, especially if you've got a really cluttered house. So Marie Kondo is a Japanese consultant for decluttering. And uh, she goes around people's houses and uh, gets them to organize themselves through like all of that stuff you've got in your cupboard, all of the nonsense you've got in your kitchen. And she gets you to put it all into a pile in categories. So like all the shoes you've got, all of the, all of the coats you've got. And then you pick up each one and you go, oh, does this bring me joy? And then Marie Kondo questions you and does, does it bring you real joy? And you're like, oh, maybe it doesn't. No, not real joy. And then you go, okay, well, you just put it aside, and then we'd say goodbye to that. And then you go through all of that, and then you've got a big pile of stuff. You now need to go through this pile and say goodbye to each one of them. 
you pick each one up and you say, uh, thank you for being a great pointer, clicker, laser thing. And thank you for enabling me to point at things at a distance and to click through slide presentations. And you think, well, that seems funny, doesn't it? Why would I stand there saying goodbye to all of my objects? But we say hello to all of the objects we bring into our life, all the services. We're lovingly saying hello to stuff. Never say goodbye, though. Another part of this needs to be actionable. Now, if you go onto pretty much any website, you're getting encouraged to share through God knows how many mechanisms. I mean, if it's a news website, you could probably guarantee there's five opportunities for you to share something with someone at any point. But we've created a system, as I was pointing out earlier, which is actually can repel nuclear weapons. We've built the internet to do just that. So it, we can't turn it off. But we're starting to recognize that we're creating quite a lot of nonsense around this. Even Facebook acknowledges in their T's and C's that they can't even control it. Once you've shared it, that's it, it's out there. Another one, this is HTC's packaging from 2014. It's pretty exciting environmentally, to be honest. It's got eco-friendly packaging. It's 98% recyclable. 76% fast renewable. And it's printed with bleeding soya ink. So that's, how good is that? I think I could just take that and just chuck it in the garden. All of that is a starting experience. It's telling you, oh, we've got this far, we've actually made a pack that isn't damaging to the environment. This bit and this bit, that says the real truth. Has anyone got a clue what that means? All that? So I'm not going to ask you because I think we'd be here all night deciphering it all, but this is, um, this is the We Directive logo. It's actually very similar to don't throw um, products in the, in the waste recycling because it's a wheelie bin. You, it's very similar to a, this has batteries in it symbol. But if it has that black line under it, it's the We Recycling one, which is the European directive about electronic products. And then you've got the C thing, which does have some background towards uh, recapturing and recycling things. Well, who knew that, eh? As users, we don't. So are we out of this system? I mean, it's our life, it's our environment, but we're not even allowed access to thinking about endings because it's hidden away behind governments and legislation and companies. Don't tell the consumers things end. Just tell them to buy another one. So some of the stuff is nice. We're getting stuff here which is like bottles, which are collapsible. A great closure experience is because they take you over the, over the ending into sort of that area where you're thinking about what's the, what's the damage in the uh, recycling process. Collapsing the volume makes you think about how much space you're messing around with in the rubbish cycle. Terms and conditions, from, these are from iTunes, of the 20,000 words I've read in it. It's 12 mentions of termination. There's six mentions of t until and two mentions of opt-out. All of them are at Apple's behest. You have no say in it. As a consumer, you're there to do bad. You can't say, oh, I've had enough of this, I'm out. You can actually leave on other mechanisms, but in terms of writing a contract that you're around, then it's not going to end amicably. When I was at us too, we uh, made an app called Rando, social, a sort of social sharing app, but without any identity. So it was an anti-social photo sharing app, we called it. Now, it done pretty well. We got up to a million users. We had 12 million Randos sent which is what we called the, f the circular photos with the map on the back. But at one point, somebody attacked it, some hackers dropped 50,000 images on it over a few seconds, and they'd done that a few times. And we started to get bored because we weren't making any money out of it. It was just a sort of an exercise. The great thing about it is, if you create something which is anonymous, we could turn it off without any problem. We didn't have a database full of people's emails and names and addresses and 
sort of identities, so we could just turn it off. There was no clutter or waste. People were emotionally saddened by it, but we didn't have any data around it, so it was good. Another thing that closure experiences need to do is be timely. So when we used to buy flights like almost 10 years ago, we used to have this thing called carbon offsetting. And as a user, you could, you could tick this little box and start to think, oh, I'm going to buy a few trees to sort of offset the carbon. But then industry thought like, oh, no, we don't want you messing around with ending experiences. We're going to do that. We're going to tuck that behind our social responsibility. And so now we're not even exposed to this, which was a great moment to ask about a closure experience to the consumer. Snapchat, obviously that does good work. If you take a naughty picture or a video, it disappears. Yeah, peace of mind, eh? <laughs> Kaya cars, interestingly, when they come to the market with seven-year warranty, previously most of the car companies were talking about two-year warranties. That's quality material discussion, that is about starting experiences. But come to the market with a seven-year warranty. Most people can't think beyond five years. That's why you get asked about your financial situation about five years into the future. But talk about seven years to someone when they're buying a car and they think like, my God, that's the whole lifespan of the car. That's end of life. Sony bought out Abimo, Ibo, Abby, Robot Dog. But they also had cats, which I like to point out. Made robots, great stuff, everyone loved them. There was a real motion bonding, and we all played around with these little robots, and it was great fun. Eventually, Sony stopped mending them a couple of years ago, and so it went onto a back street of hacking these things together and uh, mending arms and legs. It looked like some sort of post-apocalyptic hospital. But they're gonna die. The irony is 15 years, which is the similar lifespan to a real dog. Why didn't Sony pick up on this? They should have really celebrated the fact that they created dogs that actually live the same amount of lifespan. Now, we've all got debt in here, haven't we? How often has anyone said, high five, well done for paying that off? I've got a massive mortgage, eye-watering amount of debt I have. Has anyone congratulated me on ever paying it back? I've never had anyone say, thanks, Joe, for paying that bit of debt you owed us back. Oh, no, but if you've got big debt, they'll sell you more debt. They'll get you another starting experience. Oh, you're doing well with that debt. Let's give you another one. Let's not conclude this and get the money back and celebrate the fact that you can do it. Now, a do not resuscitate form is an incredibly simplistic form for life and death. It comes at the end of life when people are thinking about what the quality of their endings are going to be like. Many elderly people, when you talk to them, really don't want to be resuscitated. They want to go out normally, naturally. This form really isn't doing the trick. To the point where a lot of old people are now getting their first tattoo in their 80s and 90s. Now, I went to a company recently called Helix, which is a combination of the Royal College of Art and uh, Imperial College, and they're working at St. Thomas's around a variety of issues, but one of them is this. And we had a very good discussion around burdening all of these things into an A4 form. You've got the patient's beliefs and how they want to die, the family, how they want to die, or oh, not they want to die, they want to see their mother or father drift into a happy ending. And then you've got the, the nurses and the doctors, and everyone piles into this form, and, and then it gets missed. Stacks of DNRs aren't, aren't often respected, not consciously. So there's a few models I've been messing around with, and these aren't in any way concrete. I'm playing around with this as much as, you know, I hope to have interesting discussions with all of you. So the customer life cycle is only half of this. There's the whole reclaiming rebirth bit that we miss out on. Cradle to Cradle often focuses around here. Their most recent book is very much a celebration of not changing any of this. I disagree. I think we need to start embracing users and creating endings which are accessible, timely, 
to users. And in this, I've cut it into three landscapes. I think it's the simplest way to do it. So product landscape, service landscape, digital landscape. And um, you can cut into those some sort of like things that aren't industrialized. So you talk about obsolescence. Obsolescence is very much the industrial version of endings. Closure is uh, a lot more about user endings. So if we look around closure models and pr in products, for example, you can look at things being broken or paused. Broken, for example, snapped heel on a shoe. Paused is the books on the bookshelf or Christmas decorations in the loft. You know they're there, they're ready to go at one point. There's stacks of stuff you've forgotten idly at the back of a couple, cupboard. There's an incredible explosion of electronic products that actually we have no idea as users how to get rid of. They're out of warranty. We don't want to use them anymore because we've got an updated version and they're sort of undead, lingering in offices and homes all over the countries. There's a component of giving in uh, part of that ending cycle when you purchase something to give and then there's things that are stolen. I won't go into the obsolescence thing, I'm sure many of you know about that. The service models that we can have, which is a lot more about time out, duration, that's like two week holidays finished, credit out, pay as you go. Task of incompletion, like having that discussion with a plumber, is the boiler fixed? And withdrawal, things that are lingering, like pensions you no longer pay into and unused gym memberships that we're in denial of. And then in digital, we've created a system that actually stacks of people leave services because they're bullied or fear stuff. Isn't that mad? We've created systems like that. No one's ever gone, well, I got this new product the other day, but man, I stopped using it. It started to bully me loads. And, um, but that happens on Facebook all the time. It's incredible that we celebrate a, an environment that gets like that. Context change obviously changes stacks of things, and then we have classic ex exits. This I find very interesting in closure experiences because when we celebrate that entrepreneur, that that guy who likes done multiple startups, and you know what he's leaving behind him? Endless people that have supported that guy and have got pictures on his server or her server and bits of evidence around them. But we celebrate that. Move on, let's get going. Leave it all lingering there. It's interesting if you do go to companies that have either shut down or exited, and you go onto the um, App Store, for example, there's a lot of angry users, but no one ever thinks, those poor users over there that supported this guy's ascent to startup heaven. So, what do I think we should do? Well, certainly I think we need to balance the life cycle. And value the life that we create in all of these products in the death of them as well. Acknowledge that death, but reflect on that life, as you would grandparents, mothers, any member of your family. And every time you're sitting in a meeting room having an innovation chat or like you're starting a new product or you're starting, oh, this is the sign-up flow, etc., etc., you remember there's actually there's another end of that. It's design and ending as well. Because I think every time we have that um, very oh, that emotional hello we sort of really need to think also about deserving a grateful goodbye. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much. This is great. Is it okay so to start this product please. relationship? Yeah. Please do. Um, so we'll have like. Actually, we have plenty of time. So we have like 10, 15 minutes for like questions, and um, there's no <laughs> talk right after, so it's only going to be lunch okay. right after. So no reason to run out unless you're like super hungry. But there's going to be plenty of food, so stick around for a bit. Um, the microphone is already passing. Just one question: You mentioned um, the end of uh, the company, and we've all as read plenty of times or? as in startups. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All read the incredible journey blog post a million times. Yeah, yeah, correct. I love how that. Do, how do you design for the end of, of a company like this? I think a lot of the time we just drift out of those relationships, almost thinking, like, let's get on to another one as quickly as possible. Um, now, who writes The Incredible Journey is, I've forgotten his name, he wrote a really good blog post about how people should end those things. Very much from a business point of view, actually. 
I think there was st certain things in there which he should have, uh, or which I think are needed to be said around the experience for users as well, because they're often missed out in those things. But that was a good, a good blog, blog post, yeah. Thank you. Um, I think I saw the first microphone up there. Yeah, uh, Jenny Otero from Designer. Hi. Hi, and uh, I'm wondering about closure, especially when you don't have time for doing things anymore. Like in these days, we have too much happening, and we have no time for anything. And it's much more fun to get new things, get new clothes, get new products, get new services, yeah. rather than having that uh, spending the time for doing closure. So do you have any suggestions of how to emotionally give value to users so that they actually spend the time in the closure rather than just forgetting it and closing the door without cleaning? I, I think that's very pertinent. It's one of the reasons I think, as an audience, this is potentially the most important one. We as as uh, designers, user, desi user experience designers and stuff like that, I don't think we're consciously to blame. I think we think we're doing good work, but I do think we're at the cutting edge of this, something like this. We need to start designing those systems in. Partly the problem is that we haven't got any of those systems in place and we deny that things end. Like the Sky example, I don't think that's a, we're not necessarily saying that Sky's consciously trying to make terrible endings, they just haven't discussed it, and they haven't thought about it. And you get a business mindset, which has been established over, I guess, decades and hundreds of years, that is all about starting new, growth, 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 growth. And with that, we've got such a misplaced discussion going on when we try and challenge anything around. In fact, a good example is climate change. You think we've been discussing that for 30 years, we haven't got a vocabulary about ending or closing off or even respecting the amount of carbon that we have. We just keep, let's just try and tuck our way through this with economics. How can I still have growth with that sort of thing? So I think it's generally a problem with all of us that we not start to need building those systems in, building that vocabulary. We're going to have really bad examples at first, but we're going to get that discussion going. A good example... So you go back to the 14th century, everyone was great at death. <laughs> there was so much death going on in the 14th century, it's more than any other time in history with the Black Death. The services were overwhelmed. The church was enormously overwhelmed. Thankfully, the printing press came along and created books that people could use themselves at home. So when yet another member of their 14-person family died, they could get the book out and go, oh, we've got to do this here, this here, this here. And that, that was when we were really dealing with closure. But now we're into a space where we don't need to. We start to think about other aspects of it. Joe, thank you so much for that talk. Thanks. I appreciated some of your slides, which gave me um, a way to have discourse with my design team. I think one of the largest things that I've personally been struggling with is the concept of closure seems to be diametrically opposed to the short-term business growth yes, gains. Yes, yes, exactly. Do you have any tools that you can use to have a, co a conversation on a business level, like articles that are currently happening to say the short-term gain is so detrimental? Um, well, that's that Sky one. There is quite a few of them, but that Sky one's a great example. If you get people who are leaving your business and uh, they go off with, after getting beaten up by a professional salesperson, quite robustly probably for an hour, because it's not that you give up over like 20 minutes. You're, you're in there for an hour, you can't, you can't get out of that. And I think if you're making s people so repulsive as they exit the building, then that's, I think, a great thing for supporting that brand erosion. What I've had a marketing person tell me in my company is, well, that's great that you're all touchy-feely, but- It's not about touchy-feely though, is it? What he says is, if we, trap people, then we get their revenue for that much more of a quarter. And I totally agree with you. And, but then it gets kicked up to the CFO. So anyway. Actually, there's a lot of evidence. So um, there's quite a bit of evidence in psychology as well about repulsion of endings, etc. So cetera. I've just pulled out a couple there, but there's, there is a, quite a bit there. Maybe you could email me and we could have a long enough trying to get out some evidence for you. All right. Thank you so much. You mentioned early in your talk this idea that religion used to own all of the life closure experiences, yeah. which I thought was fascinating, <coughs> and that now medicine has taken that over and really taken it from us. Yeah. 
do you either see examples of designers really interfering with how we experience death and maybe giving it back to more people, or are there ways you think that's possible? I, I think there's a lot of designers working on uh, stuff. That Helix group, actually, because some of the guys there work on the death sort of experiences. For me personally, I think that's a metaphor for the stuff I'm doing. I think what's interesting around death, though, and the way we're having a relationship with it currently is when we start to talk about euthanasia and um, right to die. The, the, in the UK, for example, there was a recent debate. People who have any say in that is the medicine, medical industry, and the religious industry. Very little that any of us have a say about our own death, at least in the UK. I think it's probably different in a lot of Scandinavian countries. But we have so little to do with our own death. I have no right to kill myself. I think it's still illegal in some sort of tiny little legality. It's not that anyone's chasing me after I've killed myself. <laughs> but the, how, how mad is that? I'm not religious. And medicine's surely done after I've killed myself. So who... I spent all my tith, life living. Who says that I can't kill myself? Surely that's democracy, if anything is. I don't really care about anyone I'm going to vote in, but I surely should look after my own life, even if I want to end it. Hi, um, I'm Vittoria from Foolproof, and on, on the flip side, I was wondering if you had any examples of companies or um, industries that managed to deal with closure in a good way, so someone who did it in a very... Well, those, those, so I don't know how subtle it was, but the green ones, I tried to give an ex a good example. So. Snapchat, I think, is great. I, d I don't know how many times these are consciously thought, like, how do we do a good closure experience? I think a lot of them come from trying to improve the general uh, user experience. So I think Kaya Cars, that's a great example where you can start to discuss end of life. As soon as we start discussing end of life, then we can start designing it and uh, start building things around it, and that vocabulary starts to build. Hey, thanks for the gr uh, great talk. Um, I mean, as designers, we most of the time work for, for the industry. And like the industry usually only pays us for delivering individual economic value to consumers. And um, this ephemeral design, has, to, me, to my understanding, has more of a societal value. Like it's good for society to say goodbye to used resources to give them a new life, potentially. How would you say this tension can be overcome in the everyday life of a designer? I, I definitely feel your pain. It's really hard to sort of justify any budget sort of interest in, oh, what about the end of this? So one thing I was championing is like the 5% five, five for five years out of any budget. So if your client comes to you, you think, right, let's say 95% of this budget we're going to spend with you is about all of the stuff that you want to get people to onboard to your platform, etc. A tiny fraction of that, which I hope grows in the future, but a tiny fraction of that we should put towards thinking about closure experiences and endings. And 5% of your time as well, to just start that conversation going. And a good examples is like, how often have you worked for a client as an agency or whoever, and then you work for a client, and then they build this great big system, and you get everyone on board, and then who has to deal with it when people want to leave? People die, for example, but only a couple of years ago, I mean, four years ago, Google and Facebook acknowledged that oh, with a memorial page. And so many companies are inherently sort of uh, in denial of endings. Um, and I think if we start to encourage a tiny fraction of effort into, even if it's one or two meetings about how people are going to leave this service, what's the legacy? How do we unravel all the data that we've got on them? That, I think, is the next step. So it's just a fraction of the time trying to sell that in to your, to your clients. Yeah, but still, if the client would invest that 5% into a better onboarding experience, they might get more new clients. So I, I think good closure experience will kick off better general experiences. I think Sky could make so much more money out of going, goodbye, it's been great having you. Here's like 60 pounds worth of vouchers to give to your friends. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree from like, a, like a, a good experience for the user, but from an economic perspective, like your example with punching the guy, the guy on your party, 
and having him in the closet as long as he pays, as he stay, when he stays in the But that's the short-termism, I think, that we've created in our culture that is yeah, curr yeah. currently coming back to haunt us with things like climate change. The mis-selling in banks is outrageous. Like, PPI, just in, just in the UK, 13 billion, the banks are getting, getting uh, fined. Yet now the banks are so casual about getting fined, they put it on a different... That it's now coming into their um, general accounting systems as just an overhead. Yeah. I think that's pretty messed up. We're in a bad situation if we're allowing banks to normalize illegal behavior. And we can't even get a few bankers into jail, at least in the UK. There's a big problem with the acknowledgement of endings. And I, I agree, but I think the prob problem is not so much in design, but more in the value system that drives design. But we have influence. I think people yeah. listen to us, and I, I think it's a good place to start this audience. And it's a user experience. It's not the legislation experience, because that's proved that that doesn't work in, in the service industry with banking. Get, start getting the user experience going. I think we'll be in a much better place. Hi, thank you so much for your talk. It was really great. Um, I've been, this is something, a topic I've been thinking about for several years now. And right now, I work in a very fast-moving healthcare startup. And we're working very hard to just get our product and our service up off the ground. Yeah. And so we're thinking a lot about the, the beginning part. Yeah. Um, but I was wondering if you had any kind of practical advice or suggestions for how I can at least start that conversation inside of our company when everyone is so heavily focused on just getting the service running. Um, you know, how do I bring up that conversation so without... Without so that's, making that's it seem distracting. Yeah, that uh, suggestion I was uh, recommending to that guy. The 5% thing can also go to five years out. So if it's five by five by five, 5% 5 of budget, 5% of time, and five years out, you start to think about five years out, especially in digital. It's very, it flips a lot of stuff. It doesn't so much in products and uh, maybe a bit more so in services, but get the digital people think, or uh, all of you sitting down like, what's it gonna be five years out? Who's gone through the system? Who's started the system? Who's left the system? And then you start that discussion and then things will start to move on. And you start to think about endings and how that works. So, uh, and uh, there's a few techniques I've got on the website as well. I don't know if the, yeah, the website's there. So there's a few techniques I use sometimes on there. Um, Marco from the Sync Project. Hi, Marco. I just, uh, just had a question in, even though if uh, death and end of life experiences are only a metaphor, we use a lot of music, smells, other senses. So any thoughts on starting with uh, other senses, starting with music and sound for a good closure experience? Just curious. I, I'd done a book along, well, not a book, actually. I was working for a company. I'd, do, I'd done a piece on um, endings. And it's interesting in music, the cadence that we have in the West and the one which uh, is a lot more popular in the East, where ours sort of goes, da dun da dun da dun da dun And uh, we sort of close it off quite, and it's quite a, a mature and, I think, common system. You, you might know a lot more, I'm sure you know a lot more about this than I do. And in the East, there's a lot more of a, like, this is just going to go on and we're going to organically move through it. And I think it's interesting to see and observe in different cultures how endings happen because in music, it's very different. In narrative, our narrative relationship with endings has changed a lot in the last few hundred years where we're, we have um, a lot more of a fact, uh, a, like a Disney wrap it up neat, neat and tidy type uh, thing where everyone... Man, that all worked out great in the end, didn't it? And you've had the, the three-act play comes into being. And um, I think that that's, uh, wasn't like that hundreds of years ago. It was a lot more a philosophical, interesting, thought-provoking discussion piece that Disney's killed off discussion. Oh, sorry, hopefully that answered your question. <laughs> I think thank, we're conveniently out so of time. It's gone to zero, so it's uh, the end. <laughs> yes, thank, thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank you. Thank you.